We're recording. Okay, great. Thank you. Hi, this is Laura. Laura, I think you're muted. Okay, am I unmuted now? Can everybody hear me? Yes. Yes. Good. Hi, this is Laura Johnson and welcome to Encompass Live. Today we're going to talk about the Nebraska Library Board Manual and the Public Library Director's Guidebook. Um, I'm sorry that you've got a bunch of beginners today. Um, Krista is off doing E-rate training, so we're definitely second or even third string running the show today, but we'll do our best. Um, so we're going to talk about this. Sally Snyder is here to uh, add her assistance. Um, we have Anika and Sharon uh, remoting in. So hi, Anika. Hello. Say hi. Hi. And Sharon. I'm here. Great. Hi. Can we get started? You bet. Cool. Okay. So this is the Nebraska Library Board Manual. Now we did have a printed manual that came out in 2006 and this is a revision of that manual. Um, we've made it online. Frankly, one of the big reasons was expense. Um, it's much less expensive for us to put it online than it is for us to print it for, oh, I think we figured it was over a thousand um, library trustees and give them a printed manual. But there's some other really compelling reasons too. One being that we can make um, the online um, links and navigation really work for us in this to make the manual more friendly and two, um, that it's much easier for us to revise it so we can keep it fresh and up to date. So we have, um, we've worked pretty hard. Um, one of our staff members, Tessa Terry, um, has designed a navigation for us that we think makes it very easy to use. Um, it is divided into 12 chapters and a main menu. Um, and you can go to a chapter just by clicking on it. And then the chapter contents are here as well. So we can, for instance, jump down to Nebraska Statute 51202 if you like. Um, you can always get back up to the top. So we hope that this has made this pretty friendly. Um, we thought we might go, um, whoops. We thought we might go um, through it a bit. Sharon, did you have what what did you have to tell us about the manual? Did you have some things? Well, one of the things I really encourage library directors to do is to make sure that each of their library board members are aware of this and if possible to print out a copy so that they each have one. Um, one of the things that it does is, and this is a question that constantly comes up to the regional system directors, is what are the library board duties versus what are the library director duties? And we do see um, a lot of um, crossover in that that shouldn't be happening. So I really encourage you as a library director and your board to do that. My suggestion too is to use this sometimes um, as part of a board meeting if your board certainly is going for a continuing education time. Use uh, maybe 30 minutes of a board meeting to, to go through a chapter each time to make sure they all understand what their um, duties are as a board member. Anika, what was your um, thought about this? I did want to show people that we have this um, chart here, uh, the responsibilities of a board and the responsibilities of a director and we made it in a printable PDF format. It'll take it a second to come up so that people can print this off and keep it if they want to. We thought this was kind of slick. Yeah, I really like that. I think that um, it makes it really nice. Board, you can, In a board meeting, you could 
project it so that everyone's going through at the same time different sections. It's the chapter contents makes it very easy to navigate to specific things that the board maybe has questions about or to do um, just some overall board training um, and orientation if you have new board members and a nice refresher for those who have been on um, for a while. Right, and uh, in addition to that, if you go down there a little bit to the last chapters, I think, mm -hmm. Laura, can you scroll down a little bit? Um, there's a chapter. Go to the last chapter or the end of this chapter? It's near the end here. Let me take a look. Uh, no, the chapter we're in, I guess. Okay. Scrolling down there, there's a little bit on uh, sample self-evaluation and does your board measure up. These mm -hmm. are great to use with your board because oftentimes um, boards have a different view of where they're at than maybe you as a director does and mm -hmm. maybe the board in and of itself may have different views of how this, you know, how they're doing. So this is a, a great thing to use for self-evaluation and discussion to kind of see if your board is is up to snuff, say. <laughs> Well, that's good, and uh, this, again, is available in a uh, printable PDF, so people can uh, use it real easily. Um, and then we do have the chapters, kind of, let's go through the chapters a tiny bit. Um, one is a lot of the basic stuff. Um, two, trustees and the law, and this, I think this is really important and I think people um, think that, oh, reading the laws is terribly um, confusing or that they'll be in such language they don't completely understand it. Really, the laws are not terribly hard to understand and we have, one of the virtues, of course, of having it online here is that we actually have links to the laws. So if you want to go to section 51201, um, it's right there. This is the law at the Nebraska legislature. It's really not that formidable. You see that it's, it's half a page and it's not particularly hard to read. So um, I would encourage people to go ahead and read some of these laws. A lot of them are in um, Chapter 51, but you can see there are other places as well. Um, this also is one place where we have questions all the time about what do they mean by cities of the first class or the second class. Well, the first class is more than five, a population of more than 5,000 and not more than 100,000. Um, the primary class is more than 100,000 and fewer than 300,000, and then the metropolitan class is more than 300,000 inhabitants. Then second class is under uh, 5,000. So that's just one one thing you kind of need to know because they are uh, some of the laws are different for uh, bigger places than they are for smaller places. But um, they tell you the legal responsibilities. Um, and then the laws govern board meetings, and I think this is the Open Meetings Act, and it's terribly important that you understand this and what you can and can't do. Um, you were talking, Sharon, about a, a seminar you went to. Yes, I went to a seminar a couple years ago. I actually think it was put on possibly by the Department of Education. Um, but the whole idea was to really teach us on what open meeting laws mean in this state. And one of the things that just really hit me, and this is particularly true in small towns where people get together at the coffee shop at 10 and 3, um, if you have a majority of your board members, and that's usually three people or more, getting together, even if it's informally for coffee, that is considered a meeting under our Open Meeting Act, and they cannot do that legally because it's considered a meeting. Um, so there were some real things that startled me in that training and I think this is um, probably something you, you need to spend some time going over with them and talking about um, to make sure that they know um, 
what they can and cannot do because most of them will say, well, we're not talking about library business, but it's all in the perception of what they're doing. And the perception is somebody sees three or more of the library board together, the perception is they're having a meeting. So knowing the open meeting law is actually quite important. Yeah, and it is at section 84, 1407 to 1414. Again, there's a link to it right here. Whoops, yeah. Um, and you, you kind of have to choose which one then you want, and you can even get it printed out if you like. Right, and Laura, we did have a question at conference last week about uh, closed sessions that you addressed. Yes, um, you can go into a closed session if you have announced that you're going to go into a closed session and what you're going to discuss in the closed session. You cannot discuss anything that you haven't said you're going to discuss. Um, and generally, if it is a personnel um, matter, and that's usually why you go into a closed session, the person, for instance, you're discussing, you're doing a um, performance evaluation on the director. Um, it is the person, the director, or whoever is being discussed. Um, it is their right to insist that this be done in open session if they want. Um, then when you go into the closed session, you have a discussion, but you cannot take any votes. You cannot actually make any decisions in the closed session. You have to come out of closed session, back into open session, make a motion, and then vote on that in open session. So you have to be very careful about closed sessions that they really they only talk about what they say they're going to talk about, um, and that no actual decisions can be made in closed session. Um, you know, just really what they're talk what they're trying to say is that these are public meetings, that library boards are publicly accountable and that what they do should be transparent. And um, so it's, it's, not, it's not meant to embarrass people or um, hold people's feet to the fire or anything. It's just meant to make sure that things remain above board at all times and have the appearance of being above, above board. Um, so this, I think, uh, chapter 2, the one on laws, might be a little denser than some of the chapters because there are a lot of links to laws in them, but on the other hand, um, I think they really do kind of tell you what you want to know, and I would really suggest that people do uh, actually read the laws themselves because they're not that hard to read, and um, it's good to know them. Right, and one of the things we actually do get a lot of questions about the laws, and all I can say, all any of us can actually say, is this is what the state statute says, and then the interpretation is up to the person. Um, it is not up to us to interpret what the law says, so I'm constantly saying this is what the state statute says. So just um, be very careful about interpretation of the yes. law. Um, that's that's true. We are not attorneys. Um, one other thing that I think people might want to be kind of aware of is um, records and privacy. Um, you can there are some records that can or should be withheld from the public. For instance, your records of um, your circulation records, you should not make those public. Um, and there are specific um, provisions for libraries in this um, Public Records Act that I think you'd want to take a look at. Um, then we have Chapter 3. we we'll just go up here to Chapter 3, to Policies. And, you know, creating policy is one of the really important um, jobs of a library board. And, um, so this discusses kind of um, what to do, and we are, do have a few additional resources here because these are some of the um, freedom of information things, um, the Library Bill of Rights, the Freedom to Read Statement, and these two books, Sandra Nelson's Creating Policies for Results, um, and then uh, the Pittman is actually an article, How to Develop a Public Library Policy Manual. 
but we do have these things here at the commission if anybody wanted to borrow them. Um, I might say we're having a workshop session on it at our fall workshop on November oh, yeah. the 6th here okay. at Kearney. So if you, you need some work on your policies, that's the time to come. Um, and also, when we get to the librarian's manual, there's a section on uh -huh. policies in that as well. So it's in both places. Well, policy does touch on pretty much everything that people do. Anika? Yeah, I think I was just going to say this in this, it's important that it's included in both, obviously. And I think sometimes the it's policy is confused with procedure, mm -hmm. which is that director board distinction. So having board members understand what policies are, how you develop them, and especially because keeping them up to date for accreditation purposes is really important. Um, and then you're not, you know, cramming in all of your review and revisions a yeah. week before you have to continue accreditation or whatever. So um, yeah. I think that's good. Okay. Then uh, chapter four does talk a little about intellectual freedom and um, why that's important. Um, this is not something that we just pay lip service to. Um, this really is something that libraries uh, live with um, a lot. And we have, for instance, a sample um, form that you could use for a request for reconsideration if, if a um, library user challenged a book and said they didn't think we, you ought to have a particular book in the library. Uh, there's ways to handle that. Um, and we really do recommend that you read the Library Bill of Rights, the Freedom to Read and Freedom to View statements, and that you adopt these and say in your policy manual that you have adopted them. Um, occasionally, I think, we get into trouble with these things because people don't quite understand some of the ramifications of them. Um, and intellectual freedom is not, it's not condoning um, questionable materials. It's saying that in a free society we have to allow people to view and read and think what they want to think even if we don't agree with what they're with what they're thinking or using, um, and a library is a place that has to really uh, guard against um, impinging on people's rights. So I think that's very important. Then uh, Chapter Five does talk about accreditation, and of course, accreditation has changed in the last couple of years. Um, and so I think this is a nice explanation of the accreditation um, process. We've just uh, kind of, I don't know if it's completely wrapped up, but we've wrapped up most of accreditation for this year. How do you guys think it went? Well, it went quite well for us. Denise and I had, um, our, we had started a year ago with the libraries that were due to uh -huh. be accredited this year. So we were, um, I think, almost all of ours got theirs in early, so um, it went well for us, but then we have a lot of libraries that aren't accredited as well. Uh, Anika, I know you had a, a big number of libraries yeah, that for accreditation this year. Yeah, we had 30-some libraries, and I think out of that, there's maybe a handful that are either still working on it under a provisional. Um, we had some new directors come in maybe a month or two before it was mm -hmm. due, and so there was some some leeway there. But I think we did a really good job. I think everyone, most every library got theirs in and approved so far. So, what, How do you think that, what is the board's role in accreditation, would you say? I think one of the biggest things um, that I've seen so far, obviously Sharon has a lot, you know, she has more experience with this than I do, but what I saw just in the last few months is that, um, monitoring policy schedules, are you, are you updating your policies, is a really big thing. I saw a lot of libraries really scrambling to make sure that everything was up to date and reviewed. 
Um, mm -hmm. And that's a really big task to try and get done in a short amount of time. So I think the board's job really, in my view, is paying attention to that three-year schedule and kind of um, piecing out the work so that the director isn't just left to take care of it all as well, you know? Yeah. Right at the last minute kind yeah. of thing. Um, I actually have libraries that, like in their January board meeting, they review their policies on a yearly basis, which is a good thing. Um, so to come up with some kind of schedule, as you're talking about, I think is a really great thing. Um, one of the, uh, Denise and I were just talking about this yesterday um, because at the initial accreditation meeting with the board, there's ideas flying and everything, and then that task of writing the uh, plan is turned over to you know the the strategic plan that you need in order to meet the guidelines is turned yeah. over to the director, and then it's like that enthusiasm drains from the board members and the library director is left to do it all from that point on. And that can become a concern, I think, in that it's too much librarian and not enough input from the board through the whole process. Mm -hmm. Well, especially if we really, the board takes their role as um, representatives of the community really seriously so that this is, the commu this is community um, input into these plans. Yeah, that, so the strategic planning having board members actively recruit people that would be good on a committee or something like that to that kind of advocacy role. Well, I have to I have to just put in our little two cents worth here being the continuing education coordinator. Mm -hmm. Boards do have continuing education requirements for their certification and they have to be certified in order for the library to be accredited. Um, and we do see some boards scrambling um, for uh, to get their uh, all their CE in. Uh, we really would like to see them make sure that they try to do that along, um, to uh, so that it doesn't become that last minute thing, mm -hmm. um, and that they they do some CE um, with webinars, and we have a new program too. Um, of these uh, short takes that are the short videos to use during board meetings. I think it's really pretty easy for boards to do the CE if they just kind of keep it in their minds that they have to get this done. You know, they don't put it off till the last minute. Since we're since you were talking about CE, can you talk a little bit about how boards could possibly use this manual to get CE? Because they can if they yeah. have meetings. We used to have actually a um, a set of questions that people used with the board um, manual. We've discontinued that now, oh. um, and we are using what these short takes, which are um, the set of short videos from United for Libraries, and then we have discussion questions for the short takes, and I, they cover many of the same subjects, or really they the same subjects as the board manual. Um, so if you watch this, t if a, in a board meeting, if you watched a 10 minute video, you discussed it and with the uh, discussion question for 15 minutes, there's five people there, each one of those people earns one half CE credit because it was, you know, 25 minutes, it was half an hour. Um, and that's 2.5 CE credits. Well, you need 20 in the three-year certification period. So it's a really good way for the boards to talk about the important jobs and issues for the board and to get their CE as well. And this is this is Chapter 6, Certification for Boards and Libraries. Um, librarians, of course, need 45 contact hours of continuing education to be certified. Um, so we hope that this is going to make things a little easier for everyone. And then we get to Chapter 7, Planning. And this is another one. This kind of does go back to accreditation, too, because as Sharon said, you have to have a plan in order to fill out the accreditation uh, application because it is the plan that kind of determines 
what you're going to be doing in your library because you, you really want to be responsive to your community. Um, I think this talks a little bit about planning, but there is certainly more stuff about planning. Um, and again, there's some links to it. And then there are some things about some special kinds of planning, too, if you're building. That's a special kind of planning. Um, technology planning, because technology is still, although it's very much integrated into library services today, it's still a, an exp a major expense and a major part of library service. And then disaster planning, which I think we've seen in the last year or so, is really important because, boy, when, you know, when the whole roof gets blown off the library, you need to know what to do. Um, Anika, you had a couple of people who had a tough time with um, disasters, didn't you? Um, well, yeah, I mean, the Pilger Public Library is still mm -hmm. coming back from, well, and Pilger also, the library was the only standing building on Main Street after the tornadoes set um, in 2013, I think. Yeah. Um, and so they're still rebuilding and working on how they can um, best serve their community as it's rebuilding. Sharon, have you seen a lot of, do you think that many libraries have a good disaster plan in place? Probably not. Um, in fact, I'm going to an all-day webinar next Wednesday at the Frank House in UNK on disaster planning. So hopefully I'll get some um, insider tips. Um, I had um, Oconto a number of years ago, which was destroyed um, actually right around Halloween with a tornado come through and, and, and basically the town pretty much blew away. Um, and obviously they had nothing in place, so it was starting from scratch. So I think it certainly doesn't hurt to have something in place. Um, UNK, of course, had water damage uh, after a storm, really bad damage um, a couple of years ago. And they had a plan in place and knew to contact um, a local company here for pallets to put the books on and already had a... a a contract with a storage place where they could be frozen, um, which is what you do when they're wet. Because um, you freeze, you basically freeze them and then freeze dry all the, the moisture out of them. So it is important because what are you going to do if all of a sudden everything is wet? You mean who you're going to call? Who are you going to call? You need to know ahead of time who you're going to call. Okay. So. Sally says she's got a question here. The question is, can the board count their time for reading or reviewing this manual toward their CE credit hours? No. They can count discussing. So if you want to call that reviewing, okay, well, discussing, but not reading, if that makes any sense. Um, I, You know, we come... There's a whole thing here about what's continuing education and what is the board's job. And it is the board's job really to know this stuff. But so reading it I wouldn't count, but discussing it and talking about the ramifications of it, if they do it in an organized way, yes. Like you were talking about viewing the short take yeah. video and then discussing the question. The issue, that, yes. Yeah. And I do have another answer, Ghostbusters. Can okay, you? it's going to where you go. <laughs> okay, so this is planning, and of course there's strategic planning that um, we're seeing everywhere. Every place is saying you need to be responsive to your community, and that's what planning is about, is finding out what the community needs and wants. Oh, another question. One more, but the board can count the time to view and discuss this webinar. Yes. Yes, they can. Um, so in Chapter 8, budgeting and funding. And I think, I think most boards do, do um, watch the budget. I think that's because they do have fiduciary responsibility in most cases, um, if they're a governing board, certainly. Um, 
So, and this is one of those places where maybe it does matter when you um, recruit board members, you kind of try to get some board members who might have some background when it comes to um, budgeting and fundraising and um, that kind of thing. There's a sample budget in here, which is very simple, but it gives you an idea of kind of how you would set that out. Um, I liked that that was included. I've had a few directors ask me just just to kind of compare what they're doing with, you know, keeping it fresh, but I yeah. like that that sample is there for people. Well, and um, there are, of course, some comparisons you can make um, when people fill out their um, statistical report. That statistical report does go to the IMLS, who then does have a, um, they actually have a comparison um, utility on their website, so you can compare yourself in any number of categories with other libraries so you can see how you're doing. And of course we also use um, peer comparisons in the accreditation guidelines. Um, so we talk about budgeting, then chapter 9 personnel, and this may be where we really, because these things get into personalities and things, I think this is a difficult um, Sometimes this is difficult for boards. And of course, the board's big uh, job is to hire and um, supervise the director. It's the director then who should hire other staff members and um, supervise them, right? It does depend on what kind of board you have. Yeah. Is there a section on evaluation? In an advisory board situation, the city um, hires the library director. Yeah, personnel, again, this is uh, one of the things where we get into the law, and your personnel policies have to be okayed by the city before you can um, confirm them as policies in the library, right? Right. But this talks about, you know, how you would evaluate a director, um, how you would orient director. Um, it gives some sample job descriptions and evaluation forms. So I think this is actually a fairly long chapter. And it really talks about the best ways to recruit a new director. Then 10, community relations. Um, as we've said, public library boards are really um, a community um, representatives to the library. So it's important, but it also means that um, the board wants to advocate for the library and we're talking here about how to advocate for the library. And then it does talk about the Friends of the Library, which you know is a separate organization that generally will be um, organized as a uh, nonprofit organization, which the um, Internal Revenue Service calls a 501c3, and you'll very often hear them um, referred to that way. And the Friends of the Library then um, uh, support and, um, uh, well, promote the library. And then um, we have had questions about what's the difference between Friends and a foundation. And you guys want to weigh in on that one? <laughs> well... We've had problems between friends and foundations over the years. In, in most libraries, particularly small libraries, they only have a friends group, which is basically there to be a support for library programs um, in terms of a lot of times providing refreshments or prizes for programming, uh, running the annual book sale, that kind of thing. Whereas a foundation, which is for sure 
a Friends can be a 501c3 nonprofit, but a foundation must be a 501c3 uh, nonprofit. And they are there and used mostly when a library is going into some kind of a construction or expansion project because the money needs to funnel through that outside of the normal library budget. So um, there's some really strict legal things on that. If you want to create one, um, contact your um, regional library system or the library commission because we can give you some information on that. Uh, putting a foundation together usually requires an attorney to do all the paperwork. You can. Um, you can also. There is the Nebraska Community Foundation, and you can kind of do it as a sub organization for that. I understand. Um, yes. But yes, if you have sums of money that have been donated to the library or uh, earmarked for special things for the library, you really do want to have a foundation, right? Right. Yeah. Um, otherwise. Money that you get, oh, I don't want to get it. This can be a really yeah. tense topic a lot of times because um, the statutes really require that, that the city or funding authority have a separate library account. Not all of them do, and so sometimes those monies are put into the general fund when they're not supposed to go there. So if you are in any kind of fundraising, I suggest that you have a friends and or foundation to handle those funds. Yeah. Period. <laughs> I don't want to get any deeper. Well, but you know, but this is an important thing for boards to consider. Right. And a foundation is not the same thing as the library board. There might be library board members on the foundation, right? But the they can't be the, the um right. It should officers, be right? um right. you normally have um at least one person that's representative of the library on the foundation board, but you do not want them to be identical. Yeah. Um, so, and I'm sure this chapter covers that. Okay. Then chapter 11, library organizations and associations. Um, there is a, a, an association, United for Libraries, that is part of the American Library Association. Um, and the Nebraska Library Commission does underwrite um, memberships in that organization for all of the public libraries in Nebraska. So there is um, training material there, um, advisory material on their website that we really recommend to people. Then there are some other organizations as well that we think um, is actually, it's, it's useful to you, it, it helps you know what um, what issues are. It helps you know what peers are doing. Um, it can offer you support. Um, so we really do um, suggest that people um, investigate their professional organizations. Then, of course, the Nebraska Library Commission, which is a um, an independent commission. Um, governed by a board of commissioners who are appointed by the governor, um, and we are the state agency. We advocate for libraries. We handle, for instance, federal monies for libraries, aid to libraries would come through the Nebraska Library Commission. And then we have the regional systems who are um, on the ground helping libraries in the libraries every day, right? Right. Yep. Anika? <laughs> Yeah, we're out there, right? We are. Tomorrow um, I'll be on the road all day. <laughs> yeah. I'm heading out today and be and through tomorrow. Yep. Yeah. Anika is the director of the Three Rivers Library System in eastern Nebraska. And Sharon is the co-director of the Central Plains Library System in, well, I guess it's kind of in the middle, isn't it, Sharon? It is, right in the middle. <laughs> Top to bottom. Yeah. So, and then we're down to Chapter 12, Advisory Boards. And we were asked um, at NLA what the difference is between an advisory board and a governing board. Um, you guys want to discuss that or? I don't know. I think it's pretty clear here. We probably need to get on to the other manual since we don't have much time. Oh, okay. We can do that. Um, 
boards are um, governing boards at this point are required for all um, second class cities, so that cities of under 5,000 or less. Um, but um, larger places may have advisory boards. And this is really the advisory board role in many, many ways is sort of handled, um, kind of worked out, wouldn't you say? Some boards do some things where other boards might not do that, but they'll do something else. Mm -hmm. um, there are, of course, yes, there are laws. But um, there, I think it's kind of decided locally. Yeah, it, it tends to be a local kind of decision. Okay, um, we've kind of talked about this, and we hope that everybody will read it and use it, and let us know what they think because we certainly that was part of the reason to have this is that we can so easily add things to it or change things, um, and that's why it's on the web. But now we're going to go to the public library director's guidebook. This was something, Sharon, you want to give us a, you know, three-minute uh, history? <laughs> a a one-minute history on it? Yeah. Um, this was originally put together many, many moons ago. Um, when I came to Nebraska in the late 80s, um, this was already in existence called, I believe, the Librarian's Handbook. I found a, a copy of it. Um, in my library, and it really was designed to answer those questions that, as a new library director, you might have. And for me, coming in from out of state and not having any knowledge of Nebraska or how its libraries worked, it was quite helpful. It's gone through a number of revisions. The regional library systems have somewhat updated it over the years. It's always been in paper. Um, so we're happy to turn it over to the commission and have it be a, a kind of a joint project and be it online because nowadays it's so much of this information can be linked easily. Um, but the idea, again, still remains what are the kinds of things you need to know as a library director? And yes, you can contact your regional library director and the library commission but sometimes you can't get a hold of us. And so this is this is another place that where you can go and get answers. Well, we, we hope so. And we hope um, what we did, Anika, you want you were gonna talk a little bit about the process we went through to, to choose what was in this. Well, yeah, so at one of our we meet quarterly, the system directors and the Nebraska Library Commission staff. So um, at one of our meetings, we all kind of brainstormed what are some of the questions that were most asked by newer directors, um, what are questions that we remember having when we were newer directors in libraries, um, and we kind of came up with a whole list of subject areas, um, and we all started to take our own little subject that we were assigned, and we wrote out some content. So there is some extra explanation that will also be included um, that's not here in the draft yet. Um, and then that's sort of where we were right before we went to the NLA conference and we presented and asked for input from attendees there on what they would like to see. And so we're really trying to make it a resource that is influenced by the people who will be using it um, rather than just what we think every you know everyone needs to know. But um, so some of the things that we really heard were a calendar of due dates. I think that was a big one that we ended up talking about yes. last week, um, just so that you can see what will be coming up in your first year as director or in your second year or whatever, you know, but a nice way to keep those dates um, in order and present for you. Um, and we also were kind of thinking in the sense of, um, It'd be really nice if um, an outgoing director would fill out a checklist of, you know, all these things, write down passwords or whatever, but that doesn't always happen. And so this is also a, a way to find out, to begin knowing what you don't know. So you can go there and start to look at the subjects and be like, oh, yeah, I should ask about this and I should find out more about this. So we, yes, we were. 
some of this is going to be material we write, some of this is going to be um, a little explanation and then links to further resources. Um, one of the things I was finding difficult when I was doing this was what to call things. Um, I didn't think the Library of Congress subject headings were going to really do it for us. Um, and for instance, um, back up here under, where was it, copyright. Um, yeah, we have, we're, we'll need to talk about copyright and fair use probably, but when we see also movies, then this goes down to movies and talks about the um, site license that we get every year. Again, the commission purchases a site license for all the public libraries so that they can show movies in their libraries without violating copyright. Um, and what do we put that under? Do we put that under films? Do we put that under library programming? Do we list it under, I mean, you know, really, what do you, I decided to call it movies as a um, generally popularly used term. I'm not sure if that's the best or if that was right. Um, one of the reasons I thought it's probably important to make sure that this list was scannable um, so people could browse through it if they didn't. Because one of the really hard things I think about asking a question is when you don't even know what to call it. So I was hoping that if we made it browsable that people would be able to find what they needed even if they weren't sure what to call it. Um, but we really would love to have people's um, um, input on this. Uh, questions they had, things they'd like to see on this, um, that kind of thing. For those of you who are listening, um, if you have some ideas of what you would like or what you came up against and didn't know or couldn't find an answer to when you started, please contact any of us about that because um, this is still very much in, as you can tell, in the infancy stage. And so now is the time to get those things in there that, that people really want to know. As Anika said, the biggest request we had last week was for some kind of a calendar. Um, uh, like, uh, first thing you need to know is what your fiscal year is. Uh, second thing is, when is your budget request due? based upon that, um, when are the dates for E-rate, you know, four different forms, kind of when are each of those due, when is your accreditation due, all of those kinds of things would be great in some kind of a calendar, which of course we haven't figured out how to do yet, but we will get there. Yes, um, and this is labeled a draft. Um, I hope that someone coming to it now would find some useful information in it, but we hope to make it richer as time goes on. And I don't know if this is going to be one of those things that we can ever call finished. I think it's going to be one of those things that we're just going to keep adding to as time goes on, although we will try to get it into a format that we think is largely ready for prime time anyway. Um, so. I don't know. Do people have any more questions about this stuff? Um, any I comments? I want to stand slowly down so they can see what some of the topics are. Okay. And you'll know in red um, <laughs> on the first one, <laughs> where does your funding come from? Um, that's important to know. And yeah. in particular, when you're filling out your forms, your state forms, um, there's a difference if you may get money from three or four different sources, but the one thing they want to know is who is your primary source? Who, you know, who's your primary service area and what is your budget from them? That's the main one that they're going to be looking at. So I came to a library that had, it was a city, county, and regional library system through a bookmobile. So I had I had bookmobile contracts with six counties as well as the city and county budgets. So it was a very complex um, budgeting situation there. And so I really needed to know about that. 
um, you know, which one were they going to count for my statistics kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but see here, let me click on one of these links here. For instance, budgeting, your library and the budget process. Whoops, it's not there. Well, not there yet. Yeah. I turned it in. <laughs> um, here, services to people who are challenged, the talking book and braille service. This talks about what TBBS does and it has some um, links about how to, how to apply, that kind of thing. So if you have people who are visually challenged, this can help them. Um, and not all the links are internal to the commission's website. They go no, okay. to various resources. Um, for instance, here, the document retention, um, the AICPA, which is the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants or something like that, um, they say, you know, how long you should keep documents. So... We're, we're trying to link to things that we think are going to be useful for people. Um, and we'll certainly be talking more about E-Rate. As we said, Chris does an E-Rate e training right now because E-Rate um, has made some changes this year. And you can see she's got the E-Rate timeline for this year on there. Yeah. Um, the problem with putting a calendar together for E-Rate is that the dates for that change every year. And it's kind of within a range of dates, but they're never exactly the same. So that one's always difficult. Well, and they're not all the same for every institution either, are they? What, the dates? Yeah, isn't, isn't that sort of a rolling thing where some people... Well, have dates? part of it is once you... Um, do well you have the 470 then the 471 form and the next one is dependent upon you know you have to get your funding and then they're always running behind one of the problems with e-rate is you may get approval of your e-rate funding for say the year we're currently in you may not even have it yet and we're four or five months into the fiscal year. Mm. So there are some issues with that. Um, if you don't, if you're coming in new and you don't know how to file E-rate, please go to Krista's training um, yes. because she is the authority and she is our state rep for E-rate. So um, well worth spending a couple of hours at yeah. that. Definitely. But here's a mission statement. I'm pretty sure this is an outside thing. Yes. This is an, an article about how to write a mission statement if your library does not have one or you feel that you need to revise yours. So we have tried to link to things that we think will help, will help people know more about the issue or will help them solve the problem. Really is kind of where we were going. Um, so any final words? I think we've kind of gone through this. Any final words, Anika, Sharon? I'm just really excited that the trustee manual is up and ready to go, and I think that this um, director's guide is going to be really helpful once we get get some of this cleaned up, you know? Yeah, we're working on it. Sharon? <laughs> no, I think, I think both of them are great. They're really useful tools, and even though the board manual says it's a board manual, it's very helpful to you as a library director as well. Um, so it's certainly, um, you're not wasting your time if you read through that as well, because it's going to give you a lot of information you need to know. Um, so, and then I think this manual is very helpful to anyone coming in, but we just have to finish it one of these days. Well, yes, I think we, we do need to get more stuff put in here. Yeah. Um, but as I said, I don't know that it's ever going to be completely finished. I just think right. we call it ready for prime time. <laughs> um, but anyway, um, that's kind of our uh, two big documents we've been working on. We hope that people find them useful. We hope that people will give us feedback on them. 
Um, and um, we want to thank everybody for coming. Um, there are no more questions. Okay. Question board. So. So thank you, everyone, and um, tune in next week, same time, uh, 10 o'clock Wednesday morning for our next Encompass Live. Okay. Um, Anika, I think you have to hit the stop recording button. I can do that.